Gospel according to Luke. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. And then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into my homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he answered, a a hundred jugs of olive oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down, and make it 50. And then he asked another, and how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes." Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. And the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all this and they ridiculed him. So he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of others, but God knows your hearts, for what is prized by humans is an abomination in the sight of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. So, I'm the kind of person who loves a good plot twist in a TV show or book or video game or whatever. You think the writer is setting the story up to go one way and then bam, we end up somewhere else entirely. And when it's done well, well then you've got my full attention which is ironic because I also have this terrible habit when I'm at home of being like, yep, I know where my husband is going with this conversation about all the yard work we have to do or whatever. I don't really need to pay a whole lot of attention here. 
until suddenly a sentence contains the phrase with the fire and it sounds like maybe a question was happening and like suddenly he has my full attention and I'm trying to backtrack and figure out what is happening and suddenly I'm not really a fan of plot twists anymore. And today's gospel reading gives me that same sort of feeling in my gut as those conversations I sort of checked out on. Because, you know, I hear the, for the name parable of the dishonest manager, and I go, ah, yes, I know where Jesus is going with this story. That manager is bad. Let me learn all about why I should not be like him. And initially, that seems like exactly the kind of story we're going to receive. This rich landowner alleges that his manager is squandering his property. So the landowner gives the manager notice and says he needs to see the books. And the very next thing the manager does is meet with all the people indebted to his master and ask them how much they owe, and then he replaces that number with a lower amount. So not only did he not keep track of how much was owed in the first place, since he has to ask all of them what the debt even was, but now he's actively embezzling his employer so yeah, I think I get why he's being fired. And then the master approaches the manager. Okay, Jesus, so tell me about the negative consequences he faces, some kind of chastisement or punishment or something, I'm sure. But that doesn't come. Instead, the landowner praises the manager and calls him shrewd for cooking the books in a manner that goes against the master's own best wishes. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Maybe my mind started to wander at some point during the story and I missed something important. Because how is that wise behavior? And maybe now is a good time to throw in that most biblical commentaries on this text say something along the lines of, this passage is confusing, or while we can't be sure, here's our top three guesses for what is happening, or this passage is much easier to offer comments on than write a coherent sermon about, sorry preachers. So thanks Pastor Jason for giving me this week, I guess. And maybe now is also a good time to orient the story in the rest of the gospel. Because this story about debt that is being erased follows immediately on the heels of another story about debt forgiveness. The story of the prodigal son. A son who squandered his father's property and as a result he had to find work doing hard manual labor, much as the dishonest manager fears will happen to him. So the son resolves to return to his father's house and beg for forgiveness and be employed doing labor there instead. And the father sees him coming and runs to him and hugs him and restores him to his position, dresses him in the best robes, throws a party and slaughters the fattened cat to calf, not cat, to celebrate. And I know when I hear that story, I place myself firmly in the shoes of that prodigal son, and I get this joyful feeling of awe that God's love for me would continue despite whatever nonsense I get up to. No matter what, God is still running across the yard to hold me, and I'm forgiven before I even choke an apology out. Yes, Jesus, this is awesome. More of this, please. And then he gives us more. And while I wouldn't say that this story is a mere image of that prodigal story, it is still a variation on the same theme, just shot from a different angle. And for me, at least, I could see the perspectives of that father and son, and this, this interaction is good and, and holy. But with this manager, I... I struggle to find that same sense of wonder. I'm sure I'd feel very different about it if the landowner was forgiving the debt. It, it is his, after all. But the manager doing it instead? That, that seems pretty immoral. Seems like he's being dishonest with the little he's been given and therefore can't be trusted with the true wealth Jesus has been talking about. Seems like he hasn't been faithful with what belongs to another. Okay, I'm back on track. 
he is in trouble. But then Jesus slams us with the plot twist. No slave can serve two masters. You can't serve God and wealth. And this is the moment for me where much like those conversations I zoned out in that I'm backtracking and trying to piece together what was just said and the context that I'd missed because I'd assumed that the money and the riches, that dishonest wealth, that mammon that in the Middle Ages was rendered as a literal demon, that was the wealth that we needed to be faithful with. That if I had a little bit of money and did good stewardship with it, then I'd get a true riches amount. And that I wouldn't get that reward if I did bad stewardship, especially if it was someone else's money. But Jesus is saying that the money is not the riches part. People are. Our relationships with one another are. One theory for why the manager is hacking such large amounts off the debt owed without erasing it entirely is that he was removing all the interest charges. Remember, charging interest amongst one another goes against Torah law, but it was standard practice in the Roman Empire. So when the occupation began, those wealthy sons of Israel who were still in a position to give out loans suddenly had a choice before them. Do they charge interest? Do they serve God or wealth? There is no option to do both. You have to choose. From records that survived from that region, it seems like 20% was a pretty normal interest rate for loans paid using food products, although much higher rates also occurred. And that manager is removing 20% and 50% of those loan totals. Forget the landowner's position for a moment. How life-giving would an action like that be if it was your debt, if tomorrow you woke up and found that the interest rates on your credit cards or car or house or all the interest on your student loans or your medical debts or that payday loan you needed to take out an emergency or whatever other debt you're carrying was just erased, not gone to start up again next month, but just gone forever, what would you do? Probably pull out that calf to celebrate, huh? And maybe that's why the landowner calls the manager shrewd, because he sees exactly what that guy did. He removed charges that weren't supposed to be there in the first place. And the landowner can't really say anything without publicly admitting what he did. Like the scoffing Pharisees, he wants to be justified before others, wants to keep up appearances, even though it's not a secret to God what he's been doing. God sees this loyalty to wealth, and he calls it abomination. That manager was given temporary authority over another's dishonest wealth. And in so doing, he was also given a choice. Will he serve God or wealth? He could have spent this time pocketing anything of worth that was lying around or similar to the landowner, making up new fees that these people owe and then saying they need to be paid to him right now and then when he was done, skipped town. That is what loyalty to mammon would have him do. Instead, he was faithful. His last actions before he lost his position of power was to remove the predatory charges that his neighbors were no doubt struggling under. And sure, you can say that being faithful with what belongs to another means that the landowner needs to be paid what is owed. 
But here, instead, Jesus is suggesting that what belongs to another means that those 20 containers of wheat and 50 jugs of olive oil stay with those workers of the land. Those items had never truly belonged to the landowner in the first place. We want those prodigal son moments where God forgives us our extravagant debts, but so often we shy away from opportunities where we can be like this manager of dishonest wealth and forgive the debts of others, even as we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. I struggle to even comprehend what a world like that would look like as we are currently so far away from that. But what a vision to strive towards. But until that day comes, may God grant us all shrewdness and cunning so that we can find ways to bring deliverance to our neighbors this week and always. Amen.